I'm Steve Brogdon, I'm director of Thousand Oaks Library, and I just want to uh, welcome you to the sixth annual Thousand Oaks Reads One City, One Book. Okay, now, One City, One Book is a program that's been embraced by the community, it's been embraced by you. Uh, it picks up momentum every year, and, and it's helped help enhance a community of readers. One City connects us with our community, and it provides an opportunity to share ideas and uh, celebrate reading. Last year, over 4,500 people either read the book, participated in a book discussion, enjoyed a concert, listened to our speakers, went on a trip, or gathered for the author event, such as this one. This year's title, When the Killing's Done, was authored by T.C. Boyle, who's one of America's most celebrated novelists. It's a tale of environmental activism along our own California coastline. It raises questions about how much we can or should control the natural world. Each year, the One City, One Book choice is enhanced by a rich palette of, of uh, programs. They're designed to enrich our understanding of the author's intent and explore the themes and issues tacked onto the selected title. This year we explored the history and environment of the Channel Islands, a unique and beautiful habitat that includes wildlife, plants, and archeological resources found nowhere else on Earth. And we talked about environmental activism and about animal rights. We listened to the wisdom of scientists and artists and even took a trip across the sea for a first-hand look at Santa Cruz Island. Now, one, one unique part of, of this year's One City, One Book program is our photography contest. We t entitled the contest Worth Defending, and we asked patrons to submit an original image of a marine environment, and our winner is Pamela Capiste, whose compelling picture of a baby seal exploring the crab-covered rocks of the Galapagos seemed to tell a story beyond that moment. And I'm going to bring Pamela out here. One thing that, that pleases me so much about this is she has been to every One City, One Book program that we've had. And it's nice to have a photography winner who's such a supporter of the program. So please welcome Pamela Capiste. Thank you. I just wanted to make a, just a couple of brief statements, just first of all to thank the friends of the Thousand Oaks Library for putting on such incredible events every year. <laughs> this little guy is in the Galapagos Islands off of the coast of Ecuador with uh, Sally Lightfoot crabs. And uh, I just, he captured my imagination when I saw him and um, he captures the essence of the Galapagos Islands and their vulnerability and their uh, just incredible um, incredibleness. And I thought it was really appropriate that I share this uh, with you um, because we are fortunate enough to have the Galapagos Islands of the Channel Islands uh, 11 miles away from where we live. So. They also are very vulnerable, and I hope that we continue to take care of them, and we thank T.C. Boyle for bringing attention to them. Thank you. One question we often get is, is how do we choose the books that, that become the One City, One Book title? And there are several criteria that we use. High literary quality is one. Universal themes that appeal to a wide range of readers, both adults and high school. Uh, it's available in multiple formats, including paperback and audio and large print. That's something that, that people don't, don't always think about, but we want everybody to be able to have an opportunity to read the book. It's a discussable book, likely to uh, provide provocative discussions. Lends itself to creative public programming related to the book and the author's availability and willingness to participate. We are thrilled that T.C. Boyle is here. And now I'd like to bring out one of the city's uh, most enthusiastic supporters of, our, of the One City, One Book, and that's our mayor, Jackie Irwin. When we open a book together, we close it in greater harmony. 
That is the theme of Thousand Oaks Reads, One City, One Book program. And in the past six years, we've seen just how true that is. I look out in the audience and I see many familiar faces from years past. I enjoy hearing from residents about how they're enjoying the program as I um, am in and out about the community. Thousand Oaks Reads has truly brought us all together. There have been six of them already. Good for you being consistent like that. We have, we've already had six Thousand Oaks Reads books. Together we have followed a boy on his quest through New York to make sense of his father's death after 9-11 and that was extremely loud and incredibly close. We wandered through Africa with the lost boys and witnessed the horror of a battle-torn country and the hardship of making a new home in America. That was what is the what. Traveled to Los Angeles and experienced the wonder of friendship and the musical genius in the face of mental illness and homelessness, the soloist. Been transported into a proud woman's fight for her home and the gray wolves in the midst of the Great Depression in Kentucky, sweeping up glass. And we were swept up in one man's memories of worn, torn Seattle and a friendship that transcended the prejudices of the old world ancestors and the separation made by wartime decisions. The hotel on the corner of bitter and sweet. Today I'm very excited that T.C. Boyle is here because I don't know how many of you have read the Tortilla Curtain and certainly this book also, but those are books that are really taking place locally. So it's, it's um, a fun change from our other books. This year we enter the world of the Channel Islands just off our coast. We read a novelized version of the restoration of Santa Cruz Island and the struggle between environmentalists and the National Park Service and what is best for local natural habitats. We read how decisions as well as accidents can alter the world around us in when the killing is done. The programs that have revolved around the book have been wonderful this year as in past years. We've enjoyed the music, photographs, environmentalists, and many more. And today we get to hear from the author himself, T.C. Boyle. On behalf of the entire city council, and many thanks to the library and the committee who continue to whet our appetite for literature and cultural offerings, and thank you all for supporting us in this program. Have fun. Okay, one of the one of the added highlights of a program like this is that it's enabled us to um, strengthen our ties with California Lutheran University. And to that end, I'd like to introduce uh, Associate Professor Jim Bond, who will then introduce T.C. Boyle. Jim. Thank you, Steve, and thank you everyone for coming this afternoon. Um, several days ago, I was rummaging through things in my garage. I did this half-heartedly, almost as if to convince myself that I did not have time to sort through empty boxes and frayed pieces of rope and twisted bits of wire, the accumulated stuff of my life. Discouraged by the mass of junk that populated my garage, I convinced myself not to take the time to clean it up, you've probably done this as well with your garages, but to once again put it off for another day. But just as I turned away from my garage of junk, my eye caught a bit of red poking through the top edge of a well-stuffed box of childhood mementos. Opening the box, I found a childhood Christmas book that I had made in first grade out of jumbo-sized pieces of construction paper. Remember those things that we used to make in first and second grade? Um, so flipping through this handmade book from 1970, I discovered the shapes of Christmas bells decorated with gold and silver glitter and Christmas trees with berries for lights and bits of verses of a Christmas poem composed on ruled lines. Immediately, I thought of other amazing things I had created as a child, uh, things that my parents had kept and I've inherited recently, a blue and yellow torn plate made from clay, a smooth rock converted into a paperweight, rendered somewhat like a ladybug with orange and black tempera paint, um, you know, things like that. And, Recalling all of these mementos of childhood made me reflect on the wondrous creativity we all experience as children. Few of us become famous artists, composers, or writers as, as a result of our childhood experimentation. Yet there is something highly significant about that time of play and creativity that we would do well to resurrect in our adult lives 
that I think books like this one help us resurrect. I reflected when I held that, that rock, that painted rock, uh, painted like a, a ladybug, I reflected that this childhood openness to creativity, exploration, and discovery is exactly what we do when we read a book like T.C. Boyle's When the Killing's Done. This book asks us not to necessarily admire the characters, as we might in a Shakespearean play, or wax rhapsodic, as some of us do when we read a good romance novel. Instead, it asks us to pay attention to the specific perspectives of the principal characters, to notice all of the details that convey the attitudes, feelings, and mindsets of Alma Taksui and Dave LaJoy. T.C. Boyle's writing reminds me somewhat of the work of the classical composer Sibelius, who carefully assembled his pieces not with sweeping melodies, but instead put them together by repeated motifs, motifs that were often identical bits of music with tiny variations or changes along the way. And it is the accumulation of those motifs that creates musical meaning in a work like Sibelius' Second Symphony. Likewise, in T.C. Boyle's When the Killing's Done, we get the careful depiction of character by repeated patterns of behavior, reiterated streams of thought, replicated ways of inhabiting the world. And it is the accretion of these details that creates literary meaning as we read the text that helps us see how the perspectives of the characters lead inexorably to particular consequences, both for the natural world and for the human community. As critic Barbara Kingsolver has remarked, T.C. Boyle picks up a large canvas and fills it to the edges. Please join me in welcoming author T.C. Boyle. Thank you. Thanks a lot, welcome to everybody. It's a great privilege to be here. Since Jim mentions childhood uh, artwork, I have to say that uh, my first artistic horror occurred about uh, first grade when I realized that I was so happy with my drawings, but George Henry and Bob Graham could, could draw 10,000 better, times better than I ever could, so I had to give that up. But I found my metier, I think. Um, I am very, very uh, lucky in that whenever I want to discover anything, I go to a place and write a book about it. So that um, many of you will know that I lived in Woodland Hills for nearly 10 years before I made my escape up to Santa Barbara. Um, and so I wrote The Tortilla Curtain, which is set in that area and in Topanga Canyon. I used to hike those canyons. I hiked the mountains in the Santa Monica Mountains. Um, and it just seemed natural to write about them. So too, when I first moved to Santa Barbara, I wrote a book called Riven Rock. I wanted to learn about our local history. And our local historian, David Myrick, had written a two-volume uh, set called The Great Estates of Montecito. And each one of them had a wild, wild story connected with it. These, uh, for those of you who don't know, Montecito was built pretty much in the 1880s, 1890s, mainly by multi-millionaire industrialists uh, coming from the East, uh, primarily around Chicago, the Swifts, Armors, the McCormicks, and so on. And um, of all the great stories, I found one about Stanley McCormick and his wife, Catherine Dexter. Um, it's a kind of story that I could never have made up. No one could, could imagine how bizarre their story was. Um, in, in the event you don't know, um, Stanley, was very wealthy. He was uh, heir to the McCormick Reaper fortune. Catherine also was extremely wealthy. Um, they married late for their era. He was 30, she was 29. They married at her chateau in Lake Geneva, which is now the American Embassy. Um, she felt, as many women do mistakenly, that yes, he's, he's handsome, he's rich, I like him very much, but he's a little squirrely. If I could get him away from his mother, then all would be okay. <laughs> Well, that was a catastrophic mistake. And in fact, uh, the day after their wedding, they went on their honeymoon, 1905, through France for a month in a motor car. Stanley loved motor cars. 
uh, the two other individuals went with them, his mother and her mother. Now, <laughs> you can't make this stuff up, uh, you know, as a novelist. So I've been able to discover many wonderful stories uh, connected with um, places. I've always, since I moved to the West Coast, I always wanted to go to Alaska, so I did. And I wound up writing a book called Drop City about the Back to the Earth movement and a commune of hippies who move up there in 1969. A couple of years ago, I began to look at those islands off on the horizon that I'd been seeing all this time driving up the coast from uh, my job at USC. And I wondered, what, well, what goes on out there? Well, now I know. Um, I felt, in particular with When the Killing's Done, if I could meet some biologists and talk to them, that would be great. Because like you, I had followed this story in the newspapers, um, the story of the rat savior, for instance, um, who went out to Anacapa Island in order to prevent the Park Service from poisoning the feral rats that had got there uh, from uh, a shipwreck in the 1850s. Uh, the rat savior, he was known as, because he went out with a confederate and giant uh, backpacks full of vitamin K and threw them all over the island in order to save the rats from the decon, rat poison that the Park Service was dropping on the island. Um, he was arrested, by the way, for feeding wildlife at a national park without a permit. Again, <laughs> how could you make this stuff up? Um, I did get to go to the island on, on many occasions, and I did get to become very close with some of the biologists, uh, Lotus Vermeer in particular, who was then running the Nature Conservancy. I had the great privilege of being out there uh, on the very far uh, western end of the island overnight a couple of times, and to go with Rachel Wollstonecroft, the fox lady, to trap these little foxes and, uh, and, and spotted skunks, the dwarf species that are out there. Those of you who have read the book know about this. Um, they are amazing. They're, they're, uh, they look like Walt Disney had created them. Uh, the foxes are only four pounds. They say this is the size of a house cat. Not your house cats, of course, which are bloated and overfed and lying on the couch right now, but a normal, lithe house cat. Um, it, it was quite thrilling to be out there overnight in the company of the biologists because um, uh, there's no sign of human activity at night. There are no lights. There's no sounds of, of, of motors or anything like this. Um, I, I expect the only thing that would be different from thousands of years ago is those communication satellites that buzz over. I've often thought about aboriginal tribes who have their mythologies and how their mythologies have to change to take into account that suddenly some of the stars are not only moving, but zipping across the sky. But anyway, um, it, was, um, it was a really great thing to go out there. I also met Marla Daly, who is head of the Santa Cruz Island Foundation. Marla uh, is a trove of information. And while I was researching when the killing's done, um, I read historical accounts of the islands too. And that brought me to my latest novel. I've just been on tour for that uh, pretty much continuously since September 17th, much to the chagrin of my poor wife, who had to stay home with no one to clean up after her. Now I'm home. I'll take care of it. No problems. Uh, Marla uh, turned me on. She's published a lot of uh, uh, diaries and so on. She turned me on to the two stories that I talk about in San Miguel of families that had lived individually on San Miguel Island uh, one in 1888 and the other in uh, the 1930s. Um, the second family you probably know about, the Lesters, uh, who were quite well known. But the first family uh, was the Waters family. Marantha Waters was 38 years old, um, upper middle class woman living in San Francisco in a nice apartment with a piano and a cat and her adopted daughter Edith. Uh, her second husband, Will Waters, was a big ventricose, that's a big-bellied man um, who had been a Civil War veteran, and he convinced her to take the $10,000 she'd got from her first husband's death um, and invest in San Miguel Island because they could make their fortune ranching sheep, uh, king and queen of this island, sole possessors of it. Um, what could be more, oh, magnetic and beautiful and romantic to have your own island and make money off of it? Unfortunately, Marantha had consumption, or tuberculosis as we call it now, and uh, Will had told her that, 
you know, they live in San Francisco. We all know how miserable the weather is there. If she should come to this southern island of San Miguel, the weather would be terrific and it would be great for her lungs and, and she'd be fine. Um, she lasted six months and she wrote a diary, a very fragmentary partial diary, and I sort of inhabited her point of view and given a, a kind of day-to-day um, uh, -day, um, picture of what their existence might have been like. The second part of the book concerns her daughter Edith, who was 15 when her mother and stepfather took her out of school and brought her to the island. Um, Marantha died two years later, and the stepfather, Will, decided that he didn't want Edith being in school in San Francisco where she might be sneaking around with boys, for instance. And so he brought her out to the island as in some fairy tale, like the evil stepfather, and made her be the, the cook and servant for him and uh, two other uh, men who, who lived there as ranch hands. That was it. That was the, her entire life. So all she tried to do was escape. Now, I know whether or not she did escape, but of course you don't know. You'll have to read the book and find out. Um, <laughs> the second story is of the Lesters, and I'm sure you're aware of, of, of uh, Herbie Lester and Elise Lester, who lived out on the island in the 1930s. Elise wrote a very beautiful memoir uh, the King of San Miguel about it, and her daughter Betsy wrote her own memoir, my, uh, San Miguel, My Childhood Memoir. Both books are terrific, and um, they give the details of what it was like to live out there. Uh, the Lesters became very well known because uh, during the 30s, when we were in a Great Depression, uh, the press picked them up. The press was fascinated by them. All, everybody was. You know, we had uh, soup kitchens, bread lines, no one has work, and here is this family, this idol, these people out on this island, um, when Elise Lester, who was a librarian in New York City, uh, was swept off her feet by Herbie and brought out here to do this very same thing the Waters had done, um, she was 38. Uh, a spinster, uh, I mean 38 was incredibly elderly for that day, um, uh, yet she really thrived on the island, uh, even though she was so elderly. She was able to have two beautiful daughters. Um, who were featured in Life magazine, uh, featured on the radio. People were just absolutely fascinated by the Lester family. And they stayed on the island until a tragic event occurred in 1942, around the time that, uh, just after Pearl Harbor on that island. Um, but again, I, why would I want to write a book in which everybody's happy? You know, they, they, we novelists want to write about misery. <laughs> so, that said, what I propose to do now is I would like to perform a story for you, a short story, beginning, middle, and end, so you can be perfectly happy, after which we'll take your questions. Um, I should say that um, uh, you can't believe it by looking at me now, this elegant man standing before you, but I was a pretty squirrely kid, hyperactive was the term. Um, we didn't have Ritalin, we didn't have psychiatrists, we had a back door, and that's how I survived. Um, my mother taught me how to read, I couldn't sit still in class, and I was a little late to come to reading, and uh, she read aloud to me, and I think that's where I get this fascination with performing stories. I, this is why I love stories. This is why we all love stories. It's one thing to talk about them, but it's another thing to get the story itself. This story is called The Lie, and it's dedicated to everyone in the audience who has maybe had a job they really don't find that fulfilling, and maybe a Monday morning came around once when you really didn't feel like going in, and maybe, maybe you called up your boss and told him you were sick when maybe you weren't. This is for you, the lie. I'd used up all my sick days and the two personal days they allowed us, but when the alarm went off and the baby started squalling and my wife threw back the covers to totter off to the bathroom in a hobbled two-legged trot, I knew I wasn't going into work. It was as if a black shroud had been pulled over my face. My eyes were open, but I couldn't see. Or no, I could see. The pulsing LED display on the clock radio, the mounds of laundry and discarded clothes humped round the room like the tumuli of the dead, a hard driving rain drooling down the dark vacancy of the window. But everything seemed to have a film over it, a world coated in Vaseline. The baby let out a series of scaled back cries. The toilet flushed. The overhead light flicked on. My wife, Clover, was back in the room, the baby flung over one shoulder. She was wearing an old cramps t-shirt she liked to sleep in and nothing else. I might have found this sexy to one degree or another, but for the fact that I wasn't at my best in the morning, and I'd seen her naked save for one rock and roll memento t-shirt for something like a thousand consecutive mornings now. 
It's 6.15, she said. I said nothing. My eyes eased shut. I heard her at the closet, and in the dream that crashed down on me in that instant, she metamorphosed from a rippling human female with a baby slung over one shoulder to a great shining bird springing from the brink of a precipice and sailing on great shining wings into the void. I woke to the baby on the bed beside me. You change her, my wife said. You feed her. I'm late as it is. We'd had some people over the night before, friends from the pre-baby days, and we'd made margaritas in the blender, watched a movie, and stayed up late talking about nothing and everything. Clover had shown off the baby, Zanna. We'd named her Zanna after a character in one of the movies I'd edited, or actually logged, and I'd felt a rush of pride. Here was this baby, perfect in every way, beautiful because her parents were beautiful, and that was all right. Tank, he'd been in my band, co-leader, co-founder, and we'd written songs together till that went sour, said she was fat enough to eat. And I said, yeah, just let me fire up the Barbie. And Clover had given me her little drawn-down pout of disgust because I was being juvenile. We stayed up till the rain started. I poured one more round of margaritas, and then Tank's girlfriend opened her maw in a yawn that could have sucked in the whole condo in the street out front, too, and the party broke up. Now I was in bed, and the baby was crawling up my right leg, giving off a powerful reek of shit. <laughs> the clock inched forward. Clover got dressed, put on her makeup, and took her coffee mug out to the car and was gone. There was nothing heroic in what I did next, dealing with the baby and my own car and the stalled nose-to-tail traffic that made the three miles to the babysitter seem like a trek across the wastelands of the earth. It was just life, that was all. But as soon as I handed Zanna over to Violetta at the door of her apartment that threw up a wall of cooking smells, tearful Telemundo dialogue, and the diachronic yapping of her four chihuahuas, I slammed myself into the car and called in sick. Or no, not sick. My sick days were gone, I reminded myself, and my personal days, too. My boss picked up the phone. Iron House Productions, he said, his voice digging out from under the R's. He had trouble with R's. He had trouble with English, for that matter. Hello, Radko. Yes, it is he. Who is it now? It's me, Lonnie. Let me guess. You are sick. Radko was one of that select group of hard chargers in the production business who kept morning hours. And that was good for me, because with Clover working days and going to law school at night, and the baby, the baby, of course, my own availability was restricted to the daylight hours, when Violetta's own children were at school and her husband at work operating one of the cranes that lifted the beams to build the city out till there was nothing left green for 50 miles around. But Radko had promised me career advancement, moving up from logging footage to actual editing, and that hadn't happened. On this particular morning, as on too many mornings in the past, I felt I just couldn't face the editing bay, the computer screen, the eternal idiocy of the dialogue repeated over and over through frame after frame, take after take, no, Jim, stop. No, Jim, stop. No, Jim, Jim, stop. I used to be in a band. I had a college degree. I was no drudge. Before I could think, it was out. It's the baby, I said. There was a silence I might have read too much into. Then Ragko, dicing the interrogative, said, What baby? Mine? My baby? Remember the pictures Clover emailed everybody? My brain was doing cartwheels. Nine months ago, when she was born? Another long pause. Finally, he said, yes. Well, she's sick, very sick, with, with a fever and all that. We don't know what's wrong with her. The wheel of internal calculus spun one more time, and I made another leap, the one that would prove to be fatal. I'm at the hospital now. As soon as I hung up, I felt as if I'd been pumped full of helium, giddy with it, rising right up out of my seat. But then the slow seepage of guilt, dread, and fear started in, drip by drip like bile drained out of a liver gone bad. A delivery truck pulled up next to me. Rain beat at the windshield. Two cholos rolled out of the apartment next to Violetta's, the green block tattoos they wore like collars, glistening in the light trapped beneath the clouds. I had the whole day in front of me. I could go anywhere, do anything. An hour ago, it was sleep I wanted. Now it was something else. A pulse of excitement, the promise of illicit thrills, started up in my stomach. I drove down Ventura Boulevard in the opposite direction from the bulk of the commuters. They were stalled at the lights, a single driver in every car, the cars themselves like steel shells they'd extruded to contain their resentments. They were going to work. I wasn't. After a mile or so, I came to a diner where I sometimes took Clover for breakfast on Sundays, especially if we'd been out the night before. And on an impulse, I pulled into the lot. I bought a newspaper from the machine out front. 
Then I took a copy of the free paper, too, and went on in and settled into a seat by the window. The smell of fresh coffee and home fries made me realize how hungry I was, and I ordered the kind of breakfast I used to have in college after a night of excess. Salt, sugar, and grease in quantity, just to open my pores. While I ate, I made my way through both newspapers, item by item, because this was luxurious, kingly, the tables clean, the place brightly lit and warm to the point of steaming with the bustle of the waitresses and the rain at the windows like a plague. Nobody said a word to me. Nobody even looked at me but for my waitress. She was middle-aged, wedded to her uniform, her hair dyed, shoe polish, black. More coffee, she asked for the third or fourth time. No hurry, no rush, just an invitation. I glanced at my watch and couldn't believe it was only 9.30. See, that was the thing about taking a day off, the way the time reconfigured itself, and how you couldn't help comparing any given moment with what you'd be doing at work. At work, I wouldn't have eaten yet, wouldn't even have reached the coffee break. Jim, stop! No, no! And my eyelids would have weighed a hundred tons each. I thought about driving down to the ocean to see what the surf looked like under the pressure of the storm. Not that I was thinking about surfing. I hadn't been surfing more than a handful of times since the baby was born. It was just that the day was mine and I wanted to fill it. I wound my way down through Topanga Canyon. The commuter traffic dissipated by now. And I saw how the creek was tearing at the banks and there were two or three places where there was water on the road and the soft red dough of the mud was like something that had come out of a mold. There was nobody on the beach but me. I walked along the shore till the brim of my baseball cap was sodden and the legs of my jeans as heavy as if they'd just come out of the washing machine. Then I drove back up the canyon. The rain a little worse, the flooding more obvious and intense, but it wasn't anything really. Not like when the road washes out and you could be driving one minute and the next flailing for your life in a chute of piss-yellow water. There was a movie or two I was interested in. But since it was only just past 12 and I couldn't even think about lunch after the lumberjack special I'd had for breakfast, I went back to the condo, parked the car, and walked down the street, getting wetter and wetter and enjoying every minute of it, to a bar I knew. The door swung in on a denseness of purpose. Eight or nine losers lined up on their bar stools, the smell of cut lime and the sunshine of the rum, a straight shot of Lysol from the toilet and back. It was warm, dark. A college basketball game hovered on the screen over the cash register. A beer, I said, and then clarified by specifying the brand. I didn't get drunk. That would have been usual, and I didn't want to be usual. But I did have three beers before I went to the movie, and after the movie I felt a vacancy in my lower reaches where lunch should have been, and so I stopped at a fast food place on my way to pick up the baby. They got my order wrong. The employees were glassy-eyed. The manager was nowhere to be seen, and I was 35 minutes late for the baby. Still, I'd had my day. And when I got home, I fed the baby a cream of wheat, opened a beer, put on some music, and began chopping garlic and dicing onions with the notion of concocting a marinara sauce for my wife when she got home. Thoughts of the following morning, of Radko and what he might think or expect, never entered my mind. Not yet. All was well, the baby in her crib batting at the little figurines in the mobile over her head, the sauce bubbling on the stove, the rain tapping at the windows. I heard Clover's key in the door. And then she was there with her hair kinked from the rain and smelling like everything I'd ever wanted. And she was asking me how my day had gone. And I said, fine, just fine. Then it was morning again. And the same scene played itself out. Clover stutter stepping to the bathroom, the baby mewling, rain whispering under the soundtrack. And I began to calculate all over again. It was Thursday. Two more days to the weekend. If I could make it to the weekend, I was sure that by Monday, Monday at the latest, whatever was wrong with me, this feeling of anger, hopelessness, turmoil, whatever it was, would be gone. Just a break. I just needed a break. That was all. And Radko. The thought of facing him, of the way he would mold the drooping dog-like folds of his Slavic flesh around the suspicion in his eyes while he told me he was docking me a day's pay and expecting me to work overtime to make up for yesterday, was too much to hold on to. Not in bed, not now. But then the toilet flushed, the baby squalled, and the overhead light went on. It's 6.15, my wife informed me. The evening before, after we dined on my marinara sauce with porcini mushrooms and Italian-style turkey sausage over penne pasta, in the interval before she put the baby down for the night while the dishwasher murmured from the kitchen and we lingered over a second glass of Chianti, she told me she was thinking of changing her name. What do you mean? I was more surprised than angry, but I felt the anger come up in me all the same. Like my name's not good enough for you? Like it was my idea to get married in the first place? She had the baby in her lap. The baby was in high spirits, grinning her toothless baby grin and snatching for the wine glass my wife held just out of reach. 
You don't have to get nasty about it, she said. It's not your name that's the problem. It's mine. My first name? What's wrong with Clover, I said. And even as I said it, I knew how stupid I sounded. <laughs> she was Clover. I could close my eyes and she was Clover. Go to Africa and bury myself in mud and she'd still be Clover. Fine. But the name was a hippie affectation of her hippie parents. They were glass blowers with their own gallery. And it was insipid. I knew that deep down. They might as well have named her Dandelion or Fescue. I was thinking of changing it to Chloris. She was watching me, her eyes defiant and insecure at the same time. Legally? I saw her point. She was a legal secretary studying to be a lawyer, and Clover just wouldn't fly on a masthead. But I hated the name, hated the idea. Sounds like something you clean the toilet with, I said. She shot me a look of hate. With bleach in it, I said, with real scrubbing power. But now, though I felt I'd been crucified and wanted only to sleep for a week, till Monday, till Monday, just till Monday, I sat up before she could lift the baby from the crib and drop her on the bed, and then the next moment, I was in the bathroom myself, staring into the mirror. As soon as she left, I was gonna call Radko. I would tell him the baby was worse, that we'd been in the hospital all night. And if he asked what was wrong with her, I wasn't gonna equivocate, because equivocation, any kind of uncertainty, a tremor in the voice, a tonal shift, play acting, is the surest lie detector. Leukemia, that's what I was going to tell him. <laughs> the baby has leukemia. This time, I waited till I was settled into the booth at the diner, and the waitress with the shoe polish hair had got done fussing over me, the light of recognition in her eyes and a maternal smile creasing her lips. I was a regular two days in a row before I called in. And when Radko answered, the deepest, consonant, battering pole of suspicion lodged somewhere between his glottis and adenoids, I couldn't help myself. The baby, I said, holding it a beat. The baby passed. <laughs> Another beat. The waitress poured. Radko breathed fumes through the receiver. Last night at, at 4 a.m., there was nothing they could do. Passed? His voice came back at me. What is this past? The baby's dead, I said. She died. And then, in my grief, I broke the connection. I spent the entire day at the movies. The first show was at 11 and I killed time pacing around the parking lot at the mall till they opened the doors and then I was inside in the anonymous dark. Images flashed by on the screen. The sound was amplified to a killing roar. The smell of melted butter hung over everything. When the lights came up, I ducked into the men's room and then slipped into the next theater and the next one after that. I emerged at quarter of four, feeling shaky. I told myself I was hungry, that was all. But when I wandered into the food court and saw what they had arrayed there, from chapatis to corn dogs to twice-cooked machaca pretzels and Szechuan eggplant and a sauce of liquid fire, I pushed through the door of a bar instead. It was one of those over-sanitized, too bright, echoing spaces the mall designers, in their wisdom, stuck in the back of their plastic restaurant so that the average moron accompanying his wife on a shopping expedition wouldn't have to kill himself. There was a basketball game on the three TVs encircling the bar. The waitresses were teenagers. The bartender had acne. I was the only customer, and I knew I had to pick up the baby. That was a given. That was a fact of life. But I ordered a Captain and Coke just for the smell of it. I was on my second or maybe my third when the place began to fill up, and I realized with a stab of happiness that this must have been an after-work hangout with a prescribed happy hour and some sort of comestible served up gratis on a heated tray. I'd been wrapped up in my grief a grief that was all for myself, for the fact that I was 26 years old and going nowhere with a baby to take care of and a wife in the process of flogging a law degree and changing her name because she wasn't who she used to be. And now suddenly I'd come awake. There were women everywhere, women my age and older, leaning into the bar with their earrings swaying, lined up at the door, sitting at tables, legs crossed, feet tapping rhythmically to the canned music. Me, I had to pick up the baby. I checked my watch and saw that I was already late late for the second day running. But I was hungry all of a sudden, and I thought I'd just maybe have a couple of the taquitos everybody else was shoving into their mouths while I finished my drink, and then I'd get in the car, take the back streets to Violetta's, and be home just before my wife, and see if we could get another meal out of the marinara sauce with porcini mushrooms and turkey sausage. That was when I felt a pressure on my arm, my left arm, and I lifted my chin to glance over my shoulder into the face of Joel Chinowski, who occupied the bay next to mine at Iron House Productions. At first, I didn't recognize him, one of those tricks of the mind, the inebriated mind especially, in which you can't place people out of context so you know them absolutely. 
Joel, I said. He was shaking his head very slowly, as if he were tolling a bell, as if his eyes were the clappers and his skull the ringing shell of it. He had a big head, huge. He was big all around, one of those people who aren't obese or not exactly, but just overgrown to the extent that his clothes seemed inflated, his pants, his jacket, even his socks. He was wearing a tie, the only one of the 76 employees at Iron House to dress in shirt and tie, and it looked like a toy trailing away from his supersized collar. Shit, man, he said, squeezing tighter. Oh, shit. Yeah, I said, and my head was tolling, too. I felt caught out, felt like the very essence he was naming, like shit, that is. We all heard, he said. He removed his hand from my arm, peered into his palm as if trying to divine what to say next. It sucks, he said. It really sucks. Yeah, I said. And then, though his face never changed expression, he seemed to brighten around the eyes for just an instant. Hey, he said, can I buy you a drink? I mean, to drown the sorrow. I mean, that's what you're doing, right? And I don't blame you, not at all. If it was me, he let the thought trail off. There was a girl two stools down from me. Her hair pulled up in a long, trailing ponytail, and she was wearing a knit jumper over a little black skirt and red leggings. She glanced up at me, two green swimming eyes above a pair of lips pursed at the straw of her drink. Or maybe, Joel said, you'd rather be alone? I dragged my eyes away from the girl. The truth is, I said, I mean, I really appreciate it, but like I'm meeting Clover at the, well, the funeral parlor, you know, to make the arrangements. And it's, I just stopped in for a drink, that's all. Oh, man, Joel was practically erupting from his shoes, his face drawn down like a curtain and every blood vessel in his eyes going to waste. I understand. I understand completely. On the way out the door, I flipped open my cell and dialed via letter to tell her my wife would be picking up the baby tonight because I was working late. And then I left a message to the same effect at my wife's law office. Then I went looking for a bar where I could find something to eat and maybe one last drink before I went home to lie some more. The next day, Friday, I didn't even bother to call in, but I was feeling marginally better. I had a mild hangover, my head still clanging dully, and my stomach shriveled up around a little nugget of nothing, so that after I dropped the baby off, I wasn't able to take anything more than dry toast and black coffee at the diner that was fast becoming my second home. And yet the force of the lie, the enormity of it, was behind me. And here, outside the windows, the sun was shining for the first time in days. I'd been listening to the surf report on the car, in the car on the way over. We were getting six-foot swells as a result of the storm. And after breakfast, I dug out my wetsuit and my board and let the Pacific roll on under me until I forgot everything in the world but the taste of salt and the smell of the breeze and the weird strangled cries of the gulls. I was home by three, and I vacuumed, washed the dishes, scrubbed the counters. I was 20 minutes early to pick up Zanna, and while dinner was cooking, meatloaf with boiled potatoes in their skins and asparagus vinaigrette, I took her to the park and listened to her screech with baby joy as I held her in my lap and rocked higher and higher on the swings. When Clover came home, she was too tired to fight, and she accepted the meatloaf and the wine I'd picked out as the peace offerings they were. And after the baby was asleep, we listened to music, smoked a joint, and made love in a slow, deep plunge that was like paddling out on a wave of flesh for what seemed like forever. We took a drive up the coast on Saturday, and on Sunday afternoon we went over to Tanks for lunch and saw how sad his apartment was with its brick and board bookcases, the faded band posters curling away from the walls, and the deep pile rug that was once off-white and was now just plain dirty. In the car on the way home, Clover said she never could understand people who treated their dog as if they'd given birth to it. And I shook my head, tolling it, but easily now, thankfully, and said I couldn't agree more. I woke on Monday before the alarm went off, and I was showered and shaved and in the car before my wife left for work. And when I pulled up in front of the long, windowless, gray, stucky, stucco edifice that housed Iron House Productions, I was so early, Radko himself hadn't showed up yet. I took off my watch and stuffed it deep in my pocket, letting the monotony of work drag me down till I was conscious of nothing, not my fingers at the keyboard or the image on the screen or the dialogue I was capturing frame by frozen frame. At some point, it must have been an hour in, two hours, I don't know. I became aware of the intense, gland-clenching aroma of vanilla chai, hot, spiced, blended, the very thing I wanted, caffeine to drive a steak into the boredom. Vanilla chai, available at the coffee house down the street, but a real indulgence because of the cost. Usually I made do with the acidic black coffee and artificial creamer Radco provided on a stained cart set up against the back wall. I lifted my head to search out the aroma and there was Jeannie, the secretary from the front office, holding a paperboard venti in one hand and a platter of what turned out to be homemade cannoli in the other. 
What, I said, thinking Radko had sent her to tell me he wanted to see me in his office. But she didn't say anything for a long, excruciating moment, her eyes full, her face white as a mask. And then she shoved the chai into my hand and set the tray down on the desk beside me. I am so sorry for your loss, she said. And then I felt her hand on my shoulder, and she was dipping forward in a typhoon of perfume to plant the lugubrious kiss just beneath my left ear. What can I say? I felt bad about the whole business, felt low and despicable. But I cracked the plastic lid and sipped the chai, and as if I weren't even conscious of what my fingers were doing, I started in on the cannoli one by one till the platter was bare. I was just sucking the last of the sugar from my fingertips when Steve Bartholomew, a guy of 30 or so who worked in special effects, a guy I barely knew, came up to me and without a word pressed a tin of butter cookies into my hand. <laughs> hey, I said, addressing his retreating shoulders. Thanks, man, thanks. It means a lot. By noon, my desk was piled high with foodstuffs, sandwiches, sweets, a dry salami as long as my forearm, and at least a dozen gray-jacketed sympathy cards inscribed by one coworker or another. I wanted to hide, wanted to quit, wanted to go home, tear the phone out of the wall, get in bed, and never leave. But I didn't. I just sat there, trying to work, giving one person after another a zombie smile and my best impression of the thousand-yard stare. Just before quitting time, Radko appeared, his face like an old paper bag left out in the rain. He was flanked by Joel Chanowski. I glanced up at them out of wary eyes, and in a flash of intuition, I realized how much I hated them both, how much I wanted only to jump to my feet like a cornered animal and punch them out, both of them. Radko said nothing. He just stood there, gazing down at me. And then, after a moment, he pressed one hand to my shoulder in Slavic commiseration, turned, and walked away. Listen, man, Joel said, shifting his eyes away from mine. We all wanted to, well, we got together, me and some of the others, and I know it isn't much, but I saw now that he was holding a plastic grocery sack in one hand. I knew what was in the sack. I tried to wave it away, but he thrust it at me, and I had no choice but to take it. Later, when I got home and the baby was in her high chair, smearing her face with cream of wheat, and I'd slipped the microwave pizza out of its box, I sat down and emptied the contents of the bag on the kitchen table. It was mainly cash, but there were maybe half a dozen checks, too. I saw one for $25, one for 50 50 the baby made one of those expressions of baby joy, sharp and sudden, as if the impulse had seized her before she could process it. It was 5.30, and the sinking sun was pasted over the windows. I sifted the bills through my hands, tens and twenties, fives, a lot of fives, and surprisingly few singles, thinking how generous my co-workers were, how good and real and giving. But I was grieving all the same, grieving beyond any measure I could ever have imagined or contained. I was in the process of counting the money, thinking I'd give it back or donate it to some charity, when I heard Clover's key in the lock, and I swept it all back into the bag and tucked that bag in the deep recess under the sink, where the water persistently dripped from the crusted-over pipe and the old sponge there smelled of mold. The minute my wife left the next morning, I called Bradko and told him I wasn't coming in. He didn't ask for an excuse, but I gave him one anyway. The funeral, I said. It's at 11 a.m., just, just family, very private. My wife is taking it hard. He made some sort of noise on the other end of the line, a sigh, a belch, the faintest cracking of his knuckles. Tomorrow, I said, I'll be in tomorrow without fail. And then the day began. But it wasn't like that first day, not at all. I didn't feel giddy, didn't feel liberated or even relieved. All I felt was regret and the cold drop of doom. I deposited the baby at Violetta's and went straight home to bed, wanting only to clear some space for myself and think things out. There was no way I could return the money. I wasn't that good an actor. And I couldn't spend it either, even to make up for the loss of pay. That would have been low, lower than anything I'd ever done in my life. I thought of Clover then, how furious she'd be when she found out my pay had been docked. If it had been docked, there was still a chance Radko would let it slide, given the magnitude of my tragedy. A chance that he was human, after all, a good chance. No, the only thing to do was bury the money someplace. I'd burn the checks first. I couldn't run the risk of anybody uncovering them. That would really be a disaster. Magnitude 10. Nobody could explain that. Though various scenarios were already suggesting themselves. A thief had stolen the bag from the glove box of my car. It had blown out the window on the freeway while I was on my way to the mortuary. The neighbor's pet macaque had come in through the open bathroom window and made off with it, wadding the checks and chewing up the money till it was just monkey feces now. Monkey feces, monkey feces. I found myself repeating the phrase over and over as if it were a prayer. 
It was a little past nine when I had my first beer, and for the rest of the day till I had to pick up the baby, I never moved from the couch. I tried to gauge Clover's mood when she came in the door, dressed like a lawyer in her gray herringbone jacket and matching skirt, her hair pinned up in her eyes in traffic mode. The place was a mess. I hadn't picked up, hadn't put on anything for dinner. The baby, asleep in her molded plastic carrier, gave off a stink you could smell all the way across the room. I looked up from my beer. I thought we'd go out tonight, I told her. My treat. And then, because I couldn't help myself, I added, I'm just trash from work. She wasn't happy about it. I could see that. Lawyerly calculations transfiguring her face as she weighed the hassle of running up the boulevard with her husband and baby in tow before leaving for her 8 o'clock class. I watched her reach back to remove the clip from her hair and shake it loose. Oh, I guess, she said, but no Italian. She set down her briefcase in the entry hall where the phone was, and she put a thumb in her mouth a moment. Before, she said, what about Chinese? She shrugged before I could. As long as it's quick, she said, I don't really care. I was about to agree with her, about to rise up out of the grip of the couch and do my best to minister to the baby and get us out the door on famille, when the phone rang. Clover answered. Hello, uh-huh, this is she. My right knee cracked as I stood, a reminder of the torn ACL I'd suffered in high school when I'd made the slightest miscalculation regarding the drop off the backside of a boulder while snowboarding at Mammoth. Jeannie, my wife said, her eyebrows lifting in two perfect arches. Yes, she said, yes, Jeannie, how are you? There was a long pause as Jeannie said what she was going to say, and then my wife said, oh no, there must be some mistake, the baby's fine. She's right here in her carrier, fast asleep. And her voice grew heartier, surprise and confusion riding the cusp of the joke. She could use a fresh diaper, judging from the smell of her, but that's her daddy's job, or it's going to be if we ever expect to. And then there was another pause, longer this time, and I watched my wife's gaze shift from the form of the sleeping baby in her terry cloth jumpsuit to where I was standing beside the couch. Her eyes, in soft focus for the baby, hardened as they climbed from my shoe tops to my face where they rested like two balls of granite. Anybody would have melted under that kind of scrutiny. My wife, the lawyer. It would be a long night, I could see that. There'd be no Chinese, no food of any kind. I found myself denying everything, telling her how scattered Jeannie was and how she must have mixed us up with the Lovitz. She remembered Tony Lovett worked in SFX. Yeah, they just lost their baby, a little girl. Yeah, it was awful. I told her we'd all chipped in. Me too, I put in a 50 and that was excessive, I know it, but I felt I had to, you know, because of the baby, because what if it happened to us? I went on in that vein till I ran out of breath. And when I tried to be nonchalant about it and go to the refrigerator for another beer, she blocked my way. Where's the money, she said. We were two feet apart. I didn't like the look she was giving me because it spared nothing. I could have kept it up. Could have said, what money? Injecting all the trampled innocence I could summon into my voice, but I didn't. I merely bent to the cabinet under the sink, extracted the white plastic bag, and handed it to her. She took it as if it were the bleeding corpse of our daughter. Or no, of our relationship that went back three years to the time when I was up on stage, gilded in light. My message alighted under the hammer of the guitar and the thump of the bass. She didn't look inside. She just held my eyes. You know this is fraud, don't you, she said. A felony offense? They can lock you up for this. You know that? She wasn't asking a question. She was making a demand. And I wasn't about to answer her because the baby was dead and she was dead too. Radko was dead. Jeannie the secretary, whose last name I didn't even know, and Joel Chanowski and all the rest of them. Very slowly, button by button, I did up my shirt. Then I set my empty beer bottle down on the counter as carefully as if it were full to the lip and went on out the door and into the night looking for somebody I could tell all about it. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, remind everyone that uh, T.C. Boyle will be signing copies of his novel um, at the conclusion today out in the lobby. We had, and by the way, we had many audience members submit questions. Uh, I've pulled, put together some of these questions. We'll also take some from the house in a bit. Uh, Jim, I prefer the ones about differential equations, if you've got those. Start with those, okay? <laughs> well, I do have some interesting ones. The, the first one, uh, several audience members, including Jennifer, Jan, and Margaret, want to know why so many of the female characters' names begin with the letter A, and by the way, why so many of the male characters are killed off? <laughs> Great question. Well, um, 
why do they begin with A? Because of pure fun. Don't forget, in literature, even though we may be discussing subjects that move or horrify us, we're also having fun. And um, that just sort of happened. I should say that everything I write, including the story I just heard, just begins. I don't have an outline. I don't know what will happen. It just grows organically day by day. Um, as far as the male characters getting killed off, they deserved it. They had it coming. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> and I, I love that sense of uh, that your writing grows organically and that you don't begin with an outline. Um, I try to teach my own students that, that they do, do not necessarily need an outline before they begin writing. Well, because what we're doing as artists is creating something that we, we can't imagine yet. And we have to find it day by day by day and make little discoveries. Uh, Flannery O'Connor said this about her own way of working, that it is a kind of a process of discovery every day in order to find out what the story is. You, 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 your mind doesn't work on a concrete level necessarily. You know, maybe even everyone in the audience, and I, I, I got a pretty good look at you before I came on. I know that about 97% of you are writers. The, the other 3%, though, everybody has written a paper for school at some point. It's the same kind of thing. You find a subject. Um, you absorb yourself in it. Uh, you take notes. And sometimes in the process of doing that, maybe you begin in your unconscious to find a story. Now, a story like the one you just heard is just purely invented. It just happens. But uh, something like when the killing's done, of course, I, as I said, I went to the island, I met the biologists, uh, I really wanted to go there, it was great. Um, uh, took notes, uh, went to the Santa Cruz Island Foundation with Marla, studied uh, 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 diaries, letters, and newspaper articles, and in the process of doing all that, somehow I had an idea of what the story might be. Mm -hmm. Annalie, Kathy, and Gordo, and also Terry, are interested in hearing what it is like to live in Santa Barbara in general, and in particular, what it is like to live in a Frank Lloyd Wright home. Well, um, it's, it's a joy, it's, it's beautiful. I look out, it's all windows, I look outside and I see trees, that makes me very happy. I, I grew up in Westchester County in New York, and I like trees. I know that they burn though, so that makes me nervous. Um, I do have to share the house with the rats though. Um, the rats preceded me, and they will be there long after I'm gone. Uh, as you know from when the killing's done, like Dave LaJoy, I don't want to poison rats and, and have secondary poisoning and have them suffer and so on. Um, and they're far too uh, smart to be trapped, in, even in a have a heart trap. I caught one in a have a heart trap recently. And uh, it was a beautiful little adolescent rat. It was so handsome and so scared. I took it away from its mother and its warmth just above my bed, by the way, in the ceiling where they roll Coke bottles through the wall all night long. Uh, some rat game, I think, they play up there. Um, and I took him way, way up on one of the trails and let him go. And he was just so terrified. He sprang out like a kangaroo rat and went down the hill. And it was very touching and very beautiful. So. Um, the only thing I've been able to do to discourage the rats is introduce them to my daughter's cat. She moved up from LA, uh, she lived in Los Feliz, and she has an alley cat that is three times the size of those foxes on the island. It is a monster, all black, and it is a killer boy. So uh, recently, she lifted the little, at my urging, the little um, board up to the crawl space in the attic and put the rat up there. As she lifted, by the way, as she, uh, the cat up there, as she lifted it, a rat tail fell over the side because the rat was asleep there. It's its bedroom. It was so happy. But shortly thereafter, there was a squeak, and the cat came back with blood on its whiskers. And uh, as soon as I get home, I'm going to put that cat back up there. But otherwise, uh, it's, it's rat heaven. Absolutely. TC, you, you mentioned in adjacent sentences um, Dave LaJoy and rats. And that brings me to the next question um, that Jerry, Debbie, and Gail wondered about why you crafted so many unlikable characters in this novel, particularly Dave LaJoy. It seems that everyone hated Dave LaJoy and wondered why would a writer do such a thing? <laughs> well, on, on the tour for the book, which, was, which came out in uh, last year, last year, and I went on tour in winter of last year, not, not this winter, but the following one, uh, the preceding one, um, uh, I was amazed that many people 
liked Dave LaJoy because they liked his position. His position is inflexible. <coughs> Thou shalt not kill. How can we deny this? Um, <coughs> the fact that he is one of these very angry men who is utterly obnoxious in every possible way, <coughs> excuse me, um, was kind of thrilling for me. <coughs> excuse me. It's probably just SARS, no problem. Um, <coughs> In fact, um, <clears throat> the worst thing he did was the date with Alma. <clears throat> and here's how it works when you're writing a novel. Uh, I was creating Dave as a very obnoxious man, but with principle, with a strong principle. And it happened that a friend of mine who was a lawyer and single in her 50s had moved into a small town in the Bay Area. And um, she went to a very nice Italian restaurant in her village all the time and really loved it. And so she met a guy online who claimed to be tall and a lawyer. Well, he was neither a lawyer nor tall, but they had a date, and the date was in her restaurant because she wanted some protection if the guy was a lunatic. So this is her restaurant where everybody knows her. And just as in the novel, um, the guy ordered the most expensive bottle of wine, uh, sniffed the cork, took one uh, drop, uh, one sip, spat it out and said, it's, it's, it's vinegar, it's rot, get, get it out of here, and then ordered the second bottle, at which point my friend walked out. So I incorporated that date into this novel <laughs> just to give you an idea of how far Dave goes beyond the pale. That's wonderful. Material from real life, which is what writers do. But we have time for maybe two, three questions uh, this afternoon for uh, T.C. Boyle. And here in the front row. Yes. Well, what's my new book? Uh, the new book is San Miguel, which I described to you when I first got up here. Um, next fall at this time will be volume two of the collected stories, T.C. Boyle Stories 2. And um, the first volume came out in 98. And this one incorporates the three books since, plus an entirely new book called The Death in Kichewank, all together with a foreword by the author. And... Um, I know it all sounds kind of valedictory, but I'm, you know, aside from that cough, I think I've probably got a couple of good months left in me. I'll be okay. <laughs> uh, beyond that, uh, as I've joked on this tour for San Miguel, uh, San Miguel is told entirely from the point of view of women, three women, as I uh, mentioned earlier. Um, in order to properly channel them, and only my wife knows this, uh, I wore a skirt while typing the entire time. <laughs> So the novel I'm contemplating now, which I hope to begin when I'm done with this touring, which is winding up now, is um, your basic hairy-chested man's novel about American violence. That's next. <laughs> From skirts to hairy-chested men. There you have a continuum. How about another question from the house? OK. Why was the wreck of the Anubis in, it seemed incongruous and it didn't seem to belong there? My editor asked the same question, but I overruled him. Um, I wanted you to remember the pattern of shipwrecks because, of course, it be the book begins with the shipwreck and then, of course, the rats got to uh, Anacapa because of a shipwreck. So I wanted the reader not to forget that. And also, at that point, it's moving, the novel's moving at a furious pace, and it's a, a small distraction for a moment, um, and it might prefigure what finally will happen to Dave. We have time for one more question from the house. The question's about Tortilla Curtin, what sort of field research did I do, and did I actually meet people who were living in the canyon, uh, undocumented workers living in the canyon? I didn't meet them, no, but I came across their campsites and blankets and so on many times when they were out looking for work. Um, I am a sort of a fish out of water, although I've spent most of my adult life now in California. As I say, I grew up in New York, uh, 30 miles north of the city in Peekskill, and we were quite provincial. I come from a working class family. Um, I didn't know much about the West. I'd never been west of the Hudson River till. I was 21 or so, and then I went all the way west to Buffalo because I met a Buffalo gal who is my wife today. Uh, I can speak fluent Buffalese. That flat cat got hit by a car. Um, uh, by serendipity, I went to the IR Writers Workshop and got my MFA and PhD there, and then, by more serendipity, uh, USC gave me a job and I started their writing program, so I moved to California. 
and uh, California has been very uh, rich uh, material for me in many ways. Meanwhile, in growing up in New York, our language in school was Spanish. I had five years of it in high school. People laugh, but we started high school in the eighth grade. Um, and we learned about Mexican culture, and we learned to speak with a good accent, and so on. So when I moved here, I uh, went frequently to Mexico and to uh, Central America. Um, so that when I began the novel, and by the way, none of the characters is based on anybody I know. It's dedicated to Pablo and Teresa Campos, but these are just friends of mine. Uh, Pablo's a Chilean, actually, a Chilean artist from LA. Some of you may know his work um, because it was their turn. I mean, I dedicate to my friends and my family, and I love them, you know? So, no, there's not any, uh, no specific people I met. The only thing I really did, especially for the novel, was I went down with a couple of friends to Tijuana one night. Um, and stood at the wall on the other side of it and talked to people who were climbing over that night while the border patrol looked at me <laughs> with a, a real bewilderment in their eyes. But uh, really, um, I just um, let myself try to inhabit these four characters uh, and their points of view. And the idea of such a novel, and of when the killing's done too, is not to provide you with answers, but to open up the debate and make you feel something. Good. Thank you very much for this conversation this afternoon. Thank you.